Good morning. My name is James Sanderson. I'm the guy that Aaron was telling about or whatever. Nothing too fancy about me. I still type with two fingers. My wife tells me I make up words because she's a school teacher that's not even in the English language, but that's okay. Um, when I was from Michigan, worked up there for a lot of years. That's where I was born and raised. Uh, I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm a fan of anybody who will beat Ohio State. Okay, that's a big rival there. Probably don't know much about that, but uh, people actually drive around Ohio just to, that live in Michigan so they don't have to go through the state, but that, that's another thing. Um, when I worked up there, the Christian church is very strong. Is there any Christian churches here in this town? I'm not talking about the first Christian church. first Christian church is actually the disciples of Christ. I'm talking about the Christian church. Uh, up in Michigan, they go by the Church of Christ. But there's one major difference that they have, and they use the instrument. Well, one year I was asked uh, by uh, several from the Christian church. They brought their elders, their deacons, uh, their preachers together to teach on evangelism. And so I was asked to come and teach the Christian church on evangelism. And I was like, yes, I would love to. So I brought my workbook, as many of you know, using this workbook, which this lesson is going to be based off today. And... Uh, Brought that workbook and put it in front of all these preachers, in front of all, there was over a hundred, all these elders and deacons from the Christian church. We started working through some studies like we did this morning. And some of the people asked as we got into it, can, we, can I purchase that workbook? I said, well, I wasn't here to sell them, but if you want to, that's fine. And as time went on, more and more purchased them, and then one person said, could I buy ten? And I said, wait, we got to stop i got to let you guys know, there's a section in this workbook on instrumental music and on the role of women in the church, and you probably will not agree with those subjects. So I'll tell you what, why don't you guys, when we get done working through this workbook today, I wasn't here to talk about those subjects, just turn those workbooks back in, I'll give you back your money, we'll just call it even. Nobody wanted their money back. They continued to purchase more. And as we went through that day, a gentleman stood up and he said, I'm the president of our major conference here. We have a conference where we have about 500 people from the Christian church come. It's at Great Lakes Christian College in Lansing, Michigan. We have a conference there. Would you be willing to come and tell us why you believe it is wrong for us to use instrumental music? Now, can you imagine that? This guy's standing up in front of everybody. He's putting me right on the spot. I'm like, uh, Okay. <laughs> So I commit to that. I go back and tell our elders back in Saginaw where I was preaching at. And about a, uh, they were all for it. They thought it was great. And about a week later they asked me, can you be on our committee to put the conference together? I'm like, really? I'm not even of your group. And so I went and I went every month and got to know the guys really well. Well, anyways, as the time went on... Uh, I convinced them to put the instrument down. For the first time in 30-some years of them having this conference, there was no instrumental music at that conference. When I went there at the conference, it was actually, they set it up as a debate. Uh, and again, I told you I'm not too smart. Um, but they had one of their Greek scholars from the school come in and debate me. And afterwards, when I got done, there were two instructors from the school in the bathroom talking and one of our members overheard them saying that that was the best argument they had ever heard in all the years from the church of Christ of why we should not use the instrument my question to you is would you like to hear what I told them today okay are we good with that now if you said no I'm going to tell you anyways okay just let you know okay so this study is found in the workbook that I have here. And let me just tell you, this is why I'm here. I'm here to try to equip you to evangelize in our 21st century. So let me tell you a little bit about the workbook. Okay, This workbook, which we used uh, during the class, and we'll use it again tonight. But this workbook, the first section is to motivate that Christian to get out and evangelize. Okay, that's the first chapter. The second chapter has five studies to lead someone to Christ. We went through one of those studies this morning. 
Uh, after that, once a person is now a Christian, there's three studies to keep someone in Christ. That's very important. And then the next section is to bring somebody back to Christ. So if you've left the church or you're dealing with somebody that left the church, there's five studies to try to bring them back. Now that's all evangelism. But that's only less than half of the workbook. What's the rest of the workbook about? Well, the next section is helping us to trust God's Word. So if you don't believe in God's Word, there are four studies to try to convince them that this Bible is the real deal. And tonight, I hope you come because we're going to study about history and archaeology and see if we can't make it match up to the Bible. So when we, we're studying with somebody and they don't believe in the Bible, maybe that will put them over the edge. And we're going to talk about that tonight at 5 o'clock. So I hope, you, hope you're here. But this morning is chapter 6, and it deals with all kinds of doctrinal studies. Okay, And one of those is this morning's, we're going to deal with instruments. I'm from Abilene, Texas. We have ACU Christian College there, right? You realize they are using the instrument now in their chapel. You understand that? You understand where the church is going? You understand the church, the Hillcrest Church of Christ, just let the world know that they are now bringing in women preachers. Women, not Hillcrest, Highland, thank you. Highland Church of Christ, women preachers preachers just had a bible study with their preacher over this the other day okay uh southern hills women preachers women up at the communion table teaching instructing the church leading prayers it is an absolute epidemic in abilene texas there's like nine churches there now that are doing this we need to talk about this today don't we so let's talk about it. Is this a matter of opinion? Now I promise you what you hear today is going to be different than probably what you've ever heard before. So I hope you listen well. So is it a matter of opinion? These are, these are some of the things I hear people say. Okay, this is, this is when, I, when I deal with this subject, and this is, this is what I hear. Some people say, why can't we be like all the other churches and have man-made instruments of worship? Okay, that's what some people are saying in the church today. Others are saying not using instruments is just an old Church of Christ belief. You know, you guys just kind of stick out like a sore thumb, and that's just you guys got some kind of problem or something. Uh, others say the instruments would make our singing better. Boy, if we just had instruments, boy, it would it would make our singing better. Um, others say that if we would allow instruments, more people would come. Aren't we about evangelism, James? Come on. If we would just liven up our worship and get those instruments in the band and get some drums up here, more people would come to worship. I can't sing unless there's a man-made instrument. That's what some people tell me. Okay. Yeah. God thinks instruments are sinful. Some people think that. Just Here's an instrument. It's just sin. Some people say that. Okay. And others think the Bible never said we couldn't use instruments. So there's all kinds of different thoughts, all kinds of different ideas. These are some of the things that I hear people say. What we're going to try to do is we're going to try to give some answers to all of those questions today. Okay? So let's see what we come up with today. First of all, what we're going to do is we're going to use the entire Bible. Again, this is found in the workbook, and this will just take you right on through uh, that study. Okay? So let's start with the Old Testament, and let's put the whole package together. In the Old Testament, we're going to go through the timeline. We're going to go to about 1400, uh, 1440 B.C. This is going to be the time of Moses, okay? And this is the law of Moses. Remember when Moses went up on Mount Sinai, got the Ten Commandments and all these ordinances, and he comes down and presents them to the people? Listen to what he says. Now, I'm just, for time's sake, because I was told I only had 20 minutes here, I can't even give my name in 20 minutes. But I'm going to try to do my best to get real close to that, okay? So I'm just going to use the uh, uh, highlighted parts of this verse, okay? Numbers 10, verse 1 through 10. The Lord said to Moses, Make two trumpets of hammered silver. Use them for calling the community together and having the camp set out. Okay? Verse 8. The sons of Aaron, the priest, are to blow the trumpets. Verse 10. Also, at times of rejoicing, your appointed feasts and new moon festivals, you are to sound the trumpets over your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. That was pretty detailed, wasn't it? Why were the instruments to be used? 
for calling the community together. Having the camp set out and call the worship. Is that pretty uh, detailed? Is that pretty laid out? What do you think? I think so. So we've got the why, okay? Right? There it is, why the instruments were to be used. Second of all, who are to play those instruments? Pretty clear, the sons and Aaron's, uh, sons of Aaron, the priest. Pretty detailed, okay? They're the only ones that are to play them. Nobody else plays them. When are they to be played? Well, they're to be played at feast and over burnt offerings, right? Pretty detailed. And then what instruments were they to play? They were to play two hammered silver trumpets. Everything is laid out, no questions. This is what God wants, okay? So not three trumpets, not five, but two, not gold, but silver. Now we're going to move to 1000 B.C. We're moving towards the cross and the timeline, and we're going to come to the time of David. Now, this is all in the workbook, but you will see that you are going to see a pattern when you go to 1 Chronicles 16, 23, and back to 16. When you get to 900 B.C. in the time of Solomon, King Solomon, you were going to see a pattern. I'm going to explain that pattern. You'll see that in 2 Chronicles 7 and 2 Chronicles 8. When you get to 790 to 480, you get to the time of restoration. Does anybody know what that, that means? Israel got away from God. You would have good kings and good priests, and they would come in and restore things back to the pattern of how God wanted things. And here's what you see. When you look at these verses in 2 Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah, you see a pattern, a pattern, a pattern of what instruments are to be used, who's to play them, when are they to be played, and why they are to be played. Okay? And you can go all through those verses and see that. They all say the same thing. Now let's go to 720 B.C. And we're going to go to one of those re restorations uh, people that restored things back. His name is King Hezekiah. Do you remember this guy? I want you to see what it says here in 2 Chronicles 29. It says he stationed the Levites in the temple of the Lord with... Oh, we've got some new instruments here, don't we? Symbols, harps, and lyres. Okay? So we have three new instruments show up. We had just the, uh, the trumpets, but now we have cymbals, harps, and lyres. In the way prescribed by David and Gad the king's seer and Nathan the prophet. Now, some people say, and I've heard this in the church, David came up with that and God never gave him authority. This next verse destroys that. This was commanded by who? Who? The Lord. There you go. Okay. Through his prophets. So this wasn't just, hey, this is some ideas that people came up with. No, this came from God. So the Levites stood ready with David's instruments and the priests with their trumpets. Hezekiah gave the order to sacrifice the burnt offerings on the altar. And the off, as the offerings began, singing to the Lord also began, accompanied by the trumpets and the instruments of David, king of Israel. The whole assembly bowed in worship while the singers sang and the trumpeters played. And all this continued until the sacrifice of the burnt offerings was completed. So in all those other verses I just gave you, here's the pattern you see. Who was to play those instruments? Only the Levites only the priest. That's it. Pretty laid out. When and where? During sacrifices at the temple. Okay? A pattern. What instruments were to be played? Well, we had the trumpets, but now we've had added the lyres, the harps, and the cymbals. Very detailed. All those other verses give those same uh, uh, verses. Okay? Same, same ones. Okay? So, under the Old Covenant, everything was laid out plainly as how God wanted Israel to praise Him in corporate worship. And you know what I mean by corporate worship? When everyone was together, it was laid out, this is what God wanted. So what do we have? We've got the why, the who, the what, the when, and the where. Now you know where we're, you know where we're going, right? 
we're going to go to the new covenant and see if we can find those same things. But what do we find when we change covenants? When you change covenants, this is an agreement, a contract that God has made with his people. When covenant changes, it changes things. Do you understand that? Do you get that? That's major. If you don't understand that, uh, then, then this Bible is going to be a mess to you. That's why I want to, uh, when I'm leading somebody to Christ, I want to instruct them about covenant, that God is a covenant God, and He has an agreements and He makes with His people, and those, some of those covenants have been changed. We are going to the new covenant. Watch the scripture reading. By calling this covenant new, He's made the old one what? Obsolete. Okay, so the old covenant is obsolete. Okay. Now, get down to chapter 9, verse 1. The first covenant had regulations for worship. If the old covenant is obsolete, then the practices of worship are what? Obsolete. They're gone, aren't they? They're done. We don't do that anymore. Do you understand that? I mean, is anybody here doing animal sacrifices? Anybody here keeping the Day of Atonement? The Passover? Is anybody here wearing a priest robe from the tribe of Aaron? We going up to Jerusalem? Things have changed, haven't they? Yes, they have. Lots of things have changed. That verse shows it right there. So, going from the old, going to the new. And when we do that, covenant changes things. And it changes worship also, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So, let's go over here to Hebrews chapter 9. I want you to see this verse. This is kind of a, this is in the New King James Version. Just kind of stay with the verse. Don't get too lost in it, because there's some major things that we need to pull out of this. Watch what he says here in Hebrews. The Holy Spirit indicated this, that the way to the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. That had to go away, didn't it? It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices were offered, which cannot make him who performed the services perfect in regard to conscience, right? Did all those sacrifices totally fix things? No, they did not, okay? Verse 10 tells us why. Concerned only with food and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. Was there a time of Reformation coming? Was things going to change? And and, and what, what did you have in the Old Covenant? You had fleshly ordinances, physical, things you could see, things you could touch. Let me give you an example. Did you not see when they burned the incense, right? You could see the smoke going up. And what did that represent? The prayers of Israel going up, right? You had the priest robe. You had the curtain there, right? You had the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, right? And the priest could only go in there once a year behind the curtain. You had the instruments. You could see them. You could hear them. You could touch them, right? You had the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices. All of that was what? It was fleshly and it was physical. Now remember, God is going to change things. And when He changes things, there's also something else that was going on. Do you realize that all of those things that were going on were vicarious? I caught this in a Catholic funeral one time. I walk in, and I'm watching the priest. He wears a robe. Nobody else gets to wear a robe. He burns the incense. Nobody else gets to burn the incense. He's the only one that can bless the communion. None of us can do that. That is vicarious. According to him and the Catholic faith, he is doing acts of worship on the behalf of the people. That's exactly what was going on in the Old Testament. The priests, when they performed these acts of worship, they were doing it on the behalf of the people. Do you understand that? You get that? Okay? And the question is, well, why would God do that? Well, because there's a separation. Here's God in the Holy of Holies. Here's Israel out here. You can't get to me, right? 
Your sin separates me. So you have to have an intercessor go in between to connect the two. That's what the priests did. And they did the worship for the people. Now, when we come to the New Covenant, what happens? For in Himself is our peace, who has made the two one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By what? By abolishing in His flesh the law of with its commandments and regulations. When Jesus came and died on that cross, what happened to the law? What happened to its commandments and regulations? They were abolished. Do you understand that? It went away. People need to understand that. And when we come to the new covenant, and I'm looking for everybody worshiping together, right? I'm, lo- I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, how did this work? How did you go from the old to the new? In the old, they did acts of worship on behalf of the people, and we're going to move to the new, and what happens when we're all together? So I asked myself this question. Was there any time in the Old Testament when everybody worshiped together and there was no separation? that everybody participated in worship. And I found two. I found two. One is in synagogue worship. Okay? Now you have to go outside of the Bible to find this information. Okay? So in synagogue worship, okay, we have all this documentation that was given before the cross on what they did inside the synagogues. They were worshiping in synagogues prior to the cross. Okay? And when they all came together, it says that they all participated. Now everybody's participating. And when everybody participated, it says they chanted. And guess what happens when everybody participates? You see them priests? There's no priest. And guess what you never have when everybody participates? You never had an instrument. When, because why? Why? Because the priest is vicarious. He's either going to do his, your worship for you, or he is going to go away, and you're going to do the worship yourself. So when they worshiped in the synagogues, there was no priest, and there was no instrument. One more place that we find, this one is in the Bible, Old Testament times, it's the Passover meal. Now we find this in the New Testament. When Jesus came and he worshiped with his apostles... During that Passover meal, did they worship there? Yes, they did. And every one of them participated together. But guess what you didn't have? You never had a priest. And you never had an instrument. Because both are vicarious. Somebody has to do it for you. Do you see my point? Are you following me here? For everybody to participate, anything that is vicarious must disappear. Now let me ask you a question. Does God give us the right under the new covenant to worship Him directly? He does. Let's talk about that. So let's go to the new covenant and let's see if we can't see the who, the why, the what, the when, and the where. Let's see if we can find it. So let's go with some verses. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. So what do I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I'll also pray with my mind. I'll also sing with my spirit. I'll also sing with my mind. Ephesians 5, 19 and 20. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to, the, to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Speak and sing. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Through him let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Fruit of lips. And James chapter 5 says, Is there anyone in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Now there's a bunch of verses in the New Testament 
and tell us what we're supposed to do. Sing, teach, speak, and admonish. Okay? It's commanding us. You know what word was missing? Did you catch it? Play. It never said to play. Isn't that interesting? In fact, under the New Covenant, we find man-made instruments void in the worship of God in both Scripture, example, and also history. And there are four present participles written in the command form. It is telling you what to do. It is instructing you. Here's what I want you to do with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Do we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs here? Yes, we do. What do you do with them? You sing them, you speak them, you teach them, and you admonish with them. That's what you're to do. He's commanding us what to do. Do you know that that cannot speak? It can't teach? It can't admonish? It can't sing. It's impossible. Plink, plink, plink. Is that singing? No. Plink, plink, plink. Is that speaking? No. Plink, plink, plink. Is that admonishing you? No. Plink, plink, plink. Does that teach you anything? Does it? Yes or no? No. No, it does not. What was God's purpose in moving us from the old to the new when dealing with worship? Why did he start us out here and he's trying to move us to here? What was his purpose? Let's think about this. Remember the, uh, remember the old covenant, right? Here's God in the Holy of Holies and that curtain was there. What was he saying? What was he saying to the world? Stay out. Only the high priest could come in and that's only once a year. You are separated from me because of sin. Right? And what are they? They're all vicarious acts of worship done on the behalf of the people. God is now moving us from the old and moving us up the ladder to the new. And what happens when we move to the new? What happens? Here's Jesus on the cross. There he is. He's dying. And what happens? <gasps> Watch. The mo At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. What was, what was God going? What was he saying here? What was going on here? Here's that curtain. It's being torn. torn. What is he saying? He's saying, priest, you can all come in now. Can all the priests come in now? Who are the priests under the new covenant? Watch what Revelation says. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God and Father. Who's the priest? Every Christian. And what do priests get to do? They go before God. Right? All of us. Right? And what does it say? Therefore, in Hebrews, it's an important verse. Brothers, since we have confidence to where? For where can you go, priest? You can enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus and by a new and living way open for who? Us. Through the curtain, which is His body. Can you get to God now? Can you worship Him directly? Do you need someone to do your worship for you? Not anymore. And yet people are still practicing that in our world today, aren't they? People, religious groups, are in this world, in this town, are actually worshiping today, allowing others to do their worship for us, for them. And what is that? That's the old way. God's moved us beyond that. Since we are all referred to priests under the new covenant, this clearly shows us that we all now have direct throne room access to God. Therefore, we are no longer in someone performing acts of worship on our behalf. Now, under the new covenant, all of us can worship God directly and personally without any separation. Let me ask you a question. Did we do this today? Did you as a Christian take the Lord's Supper today? Did you participate in that 
personally participate in that act of worship? Yes, you did. Let me ask you another question. Did you participate in giving today? Can all Christians participate in that? Yes, they can and should. And did you participate in praying? I know there's a difference when someone is leading you in prayer. That's okay. It's, that's, that's something totally different when somebody leads you. But when he was leading you in prayer, were you actively engaged in praying? I hope so. And when we have preaching, I know I am leading you in preaching, but are you, are you active? Are you participating in this lesson today? In your mind and in your thoughts and following along in your Bible? I hope so. And what about this one? Singing. Does God want you to participate? Can you do this? Yes, you can. Under the new covenant, everybody is to participate. God is moving us up the old, from the old covenant to the new covenant. He is moving us up the ladder. These are all vicarious acts of worship that are still falsely practiced today. Would you agree? That was old covenant. That's not supposed to be happening today. What about this one? Where was that at? That was another vicarious act of worship that is also falsely being practiced today. That was supposed to be left behind. Anything under the new covenant that is vicarious in nature must disappear. And that includes man-made instruments. It's just that simple. Not that complicated. So let me ask you a question. Did we see the why? The who? It's us? The when? What? Is it all there? Was it laid out? This means yes. And this means no, James, would you please go through it again? We know we don't want that, do you? Let's conclude this lesson. God's trying to move us up the ladder. Right? God wants us all to participate in worship under the old covenant, under the new covenant. Not just a select few. Do you realize when I was in Saginaw, Michigan with the church there, there was there's all kinds of different churches, denominations on the street. And down at the end it was like a I don't know, it was like a big um shopping mall. Uh church, you go in, they had three different services, um, different times of services. You go and get your donuts, your cappuccinos, right? You walked in and it was all dark inside and there was a big neon cross. It was really cool looking in there. Well, I get done preaching, a bunch of our people are now worshiping down there. I wanted to go down there and see what was going on. So I'm done preaching. I'm going to go down there. I'm going to check it out. So I walk in, and sure enough, they got a band just like this. And they got the drums that's behind glass and stuff. Looks really cool. And then it became time to sing. And I watched. And I looked. And as I looked, this is what I saw. What were they doing? They're letting the band do their worship for them. Was that what God wanted? No. Do you realize that less people sing when the instrument is present? That is an absolute fact. When I went up and, and spoke at this conference with the Christian church, I had different Christian churches come to me and say, would you come and hold an evangelism workshop at our church? I said, I would love to, but I'm going to bring my workbook I'm going to put it in front of everybody. Are you okay with that? Yes, we are. Okay. Now, there's a couple studies in there you're not going to agree with. We're still okay with that. Would you put the instrument down? Yes, we will. We will not have the instrument playing while you're there. Ah, thank you. Thank you for doing that for me. That's kind of you. So I go down to Fort Wayne, Indiana. I'm getting ready to preach. We got dinner with the the... Um, one of the elders at, at the church there. No, it's a, I think he was an elder and a preacher. And he says, man, i got to tell you something. we got a praise team and we got a band. And last week we tried to sing without it. Couldn't do it. 
I'm sorry, but we have to have the band tomorrow. Did you hear that? They couldn't do it. They use it as a crutch. What does God want us to do? Sing. Yes, He wants us to sing. So what instrument has God given all His priests to use to praise Him so that they may all participate on an equal level? What was it? It was the voice, right, expressing itself from the heart. You all have the instrument, right? Guys, if you want, if I, I, I know, I know, you, you're, you're like me, okay? Remember that guy named O.L. Sanderson? He was a songwriter in our songbooks and stuff. I'm not related to him. If you hear me sing, you can tell that really quick, okay? All right? I don't have the greatest voice, but God wants me to sing. You may not have the greatest voice. God is not looking for your voice. In fact, He was looking for your heart. He's not looking at this awesome voice. He's the one that gave it to you. If you want to make your singing better, what do you need to do? Sing! There's an idea. That'll work, won't it? Yes, it will. Church, this is the better way. This is the biblical way. I am so afraid of what I am seeing in the church today. There is so many worldly concepts coming in. I've worked with the Christian church Everywhere I've went, I've worked with a Christian church. There is no Christian church in uh, Abilene, Texas. Okay, uh, They're all gone. But if I was there, I'd be working with them. I'm trying to get in their world because they and us were one together at one time. But I have seen and understood how they got from here to here to here to here. I was with Truett Adair. You know Truett Adair from Sunset School of Preaching? He's uh, the director of the school. I think they've got a new director now. But I was with him at the Tulsa workshop. And one year the Tulsa workshop brought in the Christian church. And they brought in a man. That, that half of their speakers are from the Christian church and half the speakers are from the Church of Christ. And I was there. And I'm sitting at this booth with Truett Adair. And he said, James, the Christian church and the Church of Christ used to look ag- almost exactly alike. But he used the King James Version. He says, but over time, it waxes worse and worse. And I am watching the Christian church get so far away from us. But now it's coming in the church. We need to talk about these situations, don't we? We need to talk about this, don't we? Biblically, not opinion, not our ideas, but let's use the Bible. Was this helpful for you today? Yes? Should we not preach about this and teach about these things? Yes. Yes, we should. We need to get back to those doctrinal issues. That good preaching, right? Remember what Paul told Timothy? Here, here you got the book of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Here's Paul instructing this young preacher. And it's the third line command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer. Is that what we're supposed to preach? Yes. What did Paul tell Timothy? Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them. If you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Watch what you teach. God has laid out His church. He knows exactly how it will work and how it will work best, and we don't have to come in and try to reinvent the wheel. Let's just let God be God and trust Him that He knows exactly what He is doing. He is moving us from the physical to the spiritual, right? And so all of those physical things went away, and now can I ask you, where is the temple of God? It's right here. Physical, you could touch it, the temple. Now it's spiritual. He's moving us up the ladder. Physical instruments, voice and heart, spiritual. You see the difference? He's moving us up the ladder. Let's leave those things back. I hope you're a Christian today. I hope you are in Christ. 
178 times it uses this phrase in the New Testament, in Christ, in Him. Do not leave this world outside of Christ. Don't leave these doors here today and you not being in Christ. And how does a person get into Christ? When they are baptized. That's where they enter in. What does the verse say? Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. All authority has been given unto me, therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The word in is the word ice in the Greek. It's E-I-S. It means the point reached or entered. Where does a person enter into Christ? When they are baptized into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Prior to that, they are still outside. We talked about that this morning. We got a religious world telling you, you don't need to be baptized to be saved. If you watch Joel Steen on TV, at the end of every one of his lessons, he'll say, if you pray this prayer, we believe that you are now in Christ. That's not biblical. That is not how a person gets into Christ. That is nowhere found in Scripture. Joel Steen, I am not concerned about what you think how a person gets into Christ. I want to know, how does the Bible say to get into Christ? Remember what Satan was. He's a liar. And he is lying to our religious world. We need to get back to the Bible and follow this Bible. Let me leave you with one more verse. It's the most depressing verse in the Bible. Wide is the gate, broad the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through. Narrow the road, small the road that leads to life, and only a few find. Guys, I don't like that verse. That's depressing to me. Many are going to go to destruction, and few are going to go to life. Would you like to know why? It's the very next words out of Jesus' mouth. Watch out for false prophets. Satan was the first false prophet. He lied to Adam and Eve, and every problem that you ever had today came from what happened that day. Don't follow false prophets. Get back to the truth, and let's follow this. And we will have the church that Jesus built. And we will be in the church of Jesus built. And he will take us into that land of glory. I hope you are a Christian today. I hope that you have obeyed the gospel. You've heard the message. You've confessed that Jesus is Lord. That you have repented of your sins. Turned that direction. Submitted to his authority. Loved God and others. Been baptized into him for the forgiveness of your sins. And raised to walk that new life. If you haven't done that today, we are here to help you. Or if you want to study, we'll just sit here and study with you all day and make sure that everything that we say comes from God's Word. Let us know as we stand and sing. Let us rise up and build the name of the Lord. Join hands and